it's such a pleasure to be here. I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to take part in this really exciting festival and um, thank all of you for coming. Uh, this is my first visit to Poland and to Krakow and I've just been really enjoying myself in your beautiful, beautiful city and, and having a fabulous time. So thank you so much for, um, for letting me have such a fun time here. Um, so what I'll be talking about today is, um, you know, the question of what is fundamental human nature and the work that I've been doing with my colleagues asking this question. Uh, of course, the question of whether humans are inherently good or inherently evil, that's been asked since pretty much time immemorial, uh, philosophers for thousands of years. But I'm always a little fond of the way that the author and writer John Barth put it. Um, he has a nice turn of phrase, a little bit of poet, poetry to it. Uh, is man savage at heart, skinned o'er with fragile manners? Or is savagery but a faint taint in the natural man's gentility, which erupts now and again like pimples on an angel's arse? And of course, the way he has phrased it, there's two answers to the question. Uh, it could be that we're good, we're inherently good, and Lao Tzu, ancient Chinese philosopher, had this approach and took this answer. Every human being's essential nature is perfect and faultless. But after years of immersion in the world, we easily forget our roots and take on a counterfeit nature. So we start out good, culture pollutes us. There's, of course, the alternative answer. We're inherently bad. Uh, and it's culture that makes us good. And Albert Einstein uh, was of this opinion. It's easier to denature plutonium than to denature the evil spirit of man. Well, of course, he came from a time where there was a lot of evil spirit going around. So maybe we can uh, forgive him uh, or understand his cynicism. Uh, but there's more than just two answers. There's a third answer to this question uh, expressed very well by Ashley Montague. We are neither. We have no inherent nature at all. Man is man because he has no instincts, because everything he is and has become, he has learned, acquired from his culture, from the man-made part of the environment, from other human beings. Well, as I said, my colleagues and I have been studying this, um, asking this question, looking at human babies. Uh, well, just very briefly, why study babies? Um, I became drawn to it very early on in my career. Um, and the reason was that I'm really interested in questions of the fundamental architecture of the human mind. How are we inherently built from our eons of evolutionary history um, to understand incoming experience and to interpret the world? What are those aspects of the human mind that are in us from the get-go? And so looking at the, you know, I view the human infant as a perfect little example of the human mind uh, in its full, you know, um, honest nature before all those corrupting influences of culture, of education, of learning, uh, and, uh, and so on. So that's why I study babies. And um, the science of infant cognition really took off, I would say, over the last three decades. About 30 years ago, uh, we moved as a field from studying things like the perception, how babies' eyes see and develop, and things like that, to really asking what's going on in their minds? What are they representing about the world, and how are they understanding the world? Prior to that, we just thought they, they didn't have any understanding, so no one even thought to ask the question. Um, and the picture that's been arising from these last three decades of research is that there's really actually quite a lot going on in the minds of infants. They're a lot smarter than, than we all had previously thought. Uh, they have some rudimentary understanding of number and even arithmetic. Uh, they have an understanding of the physical world. And they also have some social understanding. And um, more recently, the work has turned to questions about the moral life of babies, uh, both good and, you know, this heading of this uh, magazine cover, Are We Born to be Bad? 
and it's these more recent um, questions that I'll be focusing on today. So accordingly, I have two parts to my talk, and the first part is uh, the moral baby. And I love this picture, which I shamelessly just got off the internet. Uh, the, the white hat with the things reminds me of those white judges' wigs of old England. So here is this little baby uh, solemnly listening, you know, uh, with it, uh, judging the, the tragic tale that is being laid out before him to render some, some, you know, some judgment upon it. Well, we know from a lot of this recent work that there are some interesting moral sentiments that seem to emerge quite early. So empathy, for example, uh, this is not my work, um, this is uh, work by other researchers. You can see young toddlers and even infants um, will occasionally spontaneously seek to comfort those that they see in distress. Here, it's either the baby's mother or an experimenter is acting as if she has a, a hurt finger and kind of crying a little bit and feeling, you know, expressing pain about her finger, and this little toddler is con expressing concern and attempting to comfort her. And um, just to tell you, throughout my talk, I'll be showing some photographs and some videos of babies in our studies, and I want you to, obviously, the topic of this whole festival is about the emotions, and um, I want you to be just paying attention not only to the specific choice or response that the baby makes, but um, also look at their faces and see what emotional expressiveness is happening because my view is that all of what I'll be telling you today is very firmly rooted in the affective system. These are emotional um, responses and choices and decisions made from the emotions that are supported by the emotions. Uh, we know, again, from other people's studies that babies well, you don't have to go to a study to see examples of babies who are very happy to share with an adult, whether or not you want to take them up on the offer. Um, they also can observe other people sharing between themselves. And very interestingly, by just after a year of age, already expect that other people are going to share resources fairly and give equal numbers of cookies to this person as that person. And not only do they expect that, they also prefer and like better someone who's sharing resources fairly to someone who's sharing them unfairly and giving all the cookies to this one and not that one. So from very early in life, it looks like they have some type of understanding of equity and a preference for those who honor the principle of equity. In work that has been very lovelily done, very um, admirably done by Felix Warnikin and Michael Tomasello, first uh, in Germany and now in the United States, uh, they have shown that young toddlers will spontaneously help others. So here, this is Felix Warnikin having some trouble opening the cupboard. He is not asking that toddler anything. He's tried to open and failed. And that look back, that's my favorite part of the whole thing. But it's all, it's completely adorable. But that little look back that the baby gives to Felix, it's the invitation. It's now I've done it for you. It's I, now can you achieve your goal? Um, you know, he's clearly gone there with the intent to enable Felix to achieve Felix's goal of getting the books in the cupboard. So this is kind of where my colleagues and I stepped in. And um, for the first part of this talk, uh, much of the work that I am, will be telling you about next was done in collaboration with uh, Paul Bloom, my colleague at Yale. Um, OK, he's also my husband. But, um, <laughs> but in this context, uh, he was also my co-scientist. Uh, so we took up here, and we're very interested in the question, will babies also judge other people? Okay, it's nice that they, at the ages old enough to assess, are interested in, um, in uh, helping others themselves. Do they also expect others or want other people to help each other? So we showed babies a situation 
I don't, I'm not going to describe it. You can see it. And we didn't get to describe it to the babies. They just had to watch it. So. So we showed babies these scenes a few times so they could just, you know, get them good and well fixed in their heads. And then our question was, you know, when we noticed when we were looking at these types of displays, we always felt like, yay, there's that helpful uh, character that helps the individual up the hill. Oh, there's that jerk who pushed him down. Uh, and our question was, do babies feel similarly? Do they read the situation in the same way that we do? Um, so we just wanted to ask, who do babies like? And our way of asking this was just very, very simple. Um, just hand the baby the two characters at the end of the show and allow them to reach for one of them. Just encourage them to reach for whichever character they preferred. Uh, just to get it out of the way in terms of conducting rigorous science, uh, half the time, it was the blue circle who's the nice character and the red square that's the mean guy. The other half of the time, their identities are reversed. Um, sometimes the good guy's on the right when we offer it to the baby. Sometimes he's on the left. All those things are counterbalanced. And of course, extremely important, the person who is actually offering the characters to the baby doesn't know which character's who. It's very important that our experimenters be blind um, so that they don't unconsciously, you know, influence the baby in some way. And also, we have parents close their eyes um, or wear blindfolded sunglasses so they can't uh, be unconsciously influencing their baby's choice. In some of the videos I may be showing you, maybe not all the parents are blindfolded. That's because we took some of the videos specifically for demonstration purposes and kind of <laughs> were being, uh, forgetting a little bit about the rigorous science because we weren't actually using those as data. But in the actual studies, parents are, always have their eyes um, closed or covered so they can't see what's going on. So um, we also have one more measure that we used for babies who are too young to reach. Three-month-old babies are really too tiny. Um, their motor systems aren't sufficiently well developed. Uh, they're just learning to actually hold their own heads up by three months of age. So for those, we hold out the two characters and just measure who does the baby spend the more time looking at? Who do they visually orient to? So here's an actual video. Again, keep your eyes on the baby's emotional expression to the extent possible. She's just seen the same thing you saw. Okay, and there she goes. And yes, she reached for the, for the nice character. Uh, that's a six-month-old baby. And we've conducted these studies with several different types of scenarios. Uh, not just the hill climbing scenario, but this scenario here where there's a nice, attractive toy inside of this box. So this one puppet is not very successfully attempting to open this box. And that gray kitty cat is very helpful. He comes along and helps him to open it. Uh, but what happens next? Okay, again, he attempts to open the box. Still has not perfected his technique. Not being able to succeed by himself. Okay, this is the opposite of helpful. And we've done it with a third scenario, a sort of a, a game scenario where there's a ball and this one's playing with the ball and rolls it to the other, inviting him to play too. What does this character do? Is this character going to accept the invitation and reciprocate? Yes. Uh, but what about the one on the left? What is, what is that bunny rabbit going to do? Will that one reciprocate? No, that one's going to abscond with the goods. So, um, and here is a little video, if I can make it play, of a three-month-old. Just so that you get an idea, you can see an ear of each puppet, one on the left and one on the right. 
So if you're the coder, try to figure out which of those two puppets the baby is looking at more. And um, you know, three-month-old's affective expressions are pretty subtle, but this baby actually is, is giving some. So for bonus points, did she actually smile more um, at one of them? So that's, that's what the data actually look like. Uh, well, here's what the data look like in summary. That's what the data look like. You know, that's what an individual baby looks like. So the only thing you need to know for this graph is that the blue bars are the percentage of babies in each time we ran the study um, who chose the positive character. The red bars are each the percentage of babies that chose the negative character. And it doesn't matter what age is. It doesn't matter what scenarios. There's a robust preference from three months on up to orient towards the positive characters. Over and over again, we see this very reliably. That 85% is just if you average across all the individual conditions, that seems to be, on average, about um, the performance that we get of percentage who are choosing the positive character. Well, our next question was aimed at so trying to get more robustly at the question of morality. Um, do babies, you know, it's one thing to show that they like the positive character more. Are they actually making a positive judgment about that character? And are they actually making a negative judgment about the mean character? Uh, and the way we chose to ask this question was to ask how babies want other people to treat those nice and mean characters. And the way that we ran this study was first we showed them one of our scenarios. Uh, in this case, the, the ball giving and turn, giving and taking, you know, the ball turn, <laughs> the ball game, turn taking game. Uh, and then, for half of the babies, it was one of the puppets, for half the babies it was the mean puppet who ran away with the ball, is now in our second scenario, trying to open a box, and one character helps them open the box, and the other character slams the box lid shut. Of course, for the other half of babies, it's, the, the nice character who rolled back the ball, who's now trying to open the box, being helped by one puppet, hindered by another. And our question is just, you know, do babies prefer someone who's nice to the nice puppet? And what about that mean puppet? Do they still prefer a nice guy? Um, is it just always nice to be nice? Do they even care? Um, what do they want there? And here's what we find with, um, all the ages that we have tested. <coughs> when it's the giver, when it's the nice character, just as before, babies robustly prefer the one who helps that nice character open the box. Um, but when it's the mean character trying to open the box, they have just as strong a preference for the one who slams the box lid shut down on them. So it looks like babies are not only developing their own preferences, I like this one, I don't like this one, but also possibly developing a sense of, you know, what's the deservingness of these different characters? And we also know by the time we, they are old enough for us to test their own behavior, when we give them scenarios where they themselves can reward one of the characters by giving a treat to them, or have the opportunity to punish one of the characters by taking a treat away, they'll reward the good character and they'll actively approach the bad character in order to take a treat away themselves. So they seem to have some op real opinions about how they want these characters to be treated. Um, how strong are their attitudes to these characters? We can ask this in several ways. Uh, one way is to ask how, what type of memory do they have for these events and for the identities of the characters, for who's nice and who's mean. We know things that are really important to us, information that's salient and that matters, we tend to remember a lot longer than information that's trivial and we don't care about. So, we ran these studies first, showing babies one of our scenarios, introducing them to a nice guy and a mean guy, and then gave them the choice between the two characters seven to 10 days later. And, you know, we tested two ages, 13 months and seven months, and the effect is just as strong after a full week <laughs> as it is after two minutes, there has been no degradation at all in, in baby's preference. So this tells us that it's been significantly encoded uh, in baby's memory. Well, we 
we can ask this question another way as well. How much do babies prefer nice guys? Uh, in terms of concretely, materially, how much is it worth to them? Well, babies are no dummies. And they like more of a good thing rather than less of a good thing, just like you or me. If you give babies a choice between these two plates of delectable, magnificently yummy graham cracker, they will choose, just like you or I, um, they're gonna choose the two graham crackers, not the one. And if you just give them that choice, you find that result over and over again to pretty much no, no, no parent's surprise. But let's put a spin on it. What if we have two puppets offering these two plates and a nice puppet who's just been seen being helpful and friendly is offering the plate with just one graham cracker and a mean guy who's just been seen being unhelpful is offering the plate uh, with the other. What do babies do? Uh, here is a video. You can't see the graham crackers very well. It's the top plate that has the single cracker on it. So she's really thinking about it, and that's why I wanted to show you this, because uh -oh, you can see, you can kind of almost see the thought process going on her face there. Uh, and indeed, uh, what we find is that the vast majority of babies will choose the single cracker. They'll give up uh, an offer twice as large, you know, they'll accept the half as large offer just to avoid interacting with the mean guy. Well. All right, all right, baby. What's your price? Okay, the sad point is babies do have a price. Um, I mean, that's kind of magnificent too, going back to what I said before, that what we've been finding over and over again is that there's a lot more internal complexity. The fact that they have a price at all is telling us they're not just following some simple absolute rule, but they're conducting a cost-benefit analysis um, as a routine part of their day-to-day -day choices in life. But even here, the reason this is dashed lines is that um, it, it wasn't actually in this sample a statistically significant preference. There was a preference. We don't know if um, with a, a larger number of babies that would be reliable or if they'd go to half and half. But even here, in our specific sample, one third of babies were holding out and accepting one single puny cracker from the good guy rather than interact with this jerk. And I love this study for two reasons. The first just shows, um, along with the memory study, that it really matters to babies. These judgments are really, really important. They're undergirding, you know, important decisions in a baby's life. And the other reason I love it is that it just shows, hooray, in this world where a lot of times uh, in recent months, you know, we're all wondering if, is there any cost at all? Like what, who, you know, who's, in, who's got the reins and is, is there gonna, are they ever gonna have their comeuppance? It really costs to be a jerk. That bad guy is having to offer very considerable recompense in order to regain the um, ability to, to interact and be chosen as a partner. Um, by these babies. So, ah, w don't, don't blink, this is a very short video, but again it just goes to um, the thoughts that are going on in babies' minds. Um, every now and then we observe a spontaneous interaction, um, action of a baby, uh, separate from an actual choice, and that baby just reached out and poof, um, and yes, it was the bad character that he, uh, <laughs> gave his just desserts to. So just to pause here, are these, are these really moral sentiments? Can we talk about this as a system of morality? And I'm gonna say, well, I'm not gonna define morality because that would take us you know, into next month at least. Uh, and I'd rather be a, you know, scientifically skirt the question by saying there are certain traits and features of what we mean by morality and we can talk about different aspects. Uh, and what we can certainly say about these responses is that babies are judging social interactions, the actions of one individual to another 
social um, individual. And they're doing it in ways that access th these babies and young toddlers' notions of deservingness, uh, of reward and punishment. So they're valenced reactions. Um, and the final point, this is Lady Justice who is blind. Babies are doing this as disinterested bystanders, as third parties. They've never met these other characters. They're not friends with one of them. They're not enemies with the other. They've never met any of the three of them before. But nonetheless, they can render a judgment about how person A is treating person B. And this may be really um, something that is uniquely human. We do find instances in the animal world where mem a member of a species will punish another for treating a third member of the species badly. But the only examples we have of those are where the character who's mad at Joe for being mean to Pete um, is because that character knows the third party is either uh, related to or affiliated with, an ally with the character who's been treated badly. So we don't find examples, or haven't yet, in the animal kingdom of an individual looking at other individuals it doesn't know and approving of some and disapproving of others on the basis of their behavior. Yet we find this in a three-month-old human being. All right, well, are these moral sentiments? Um, I hope you've been remembering to just look at the affective responses on the baby's emotional expressions. We can see them smiling when they look towards the good characters a fair bit of the time. Um, their faces are often much more solemn and uh, scientifically are reliably more solemn when they are observing the, the mean actions. Um, we're getting responses that indicate liking for one character, dislike of the other, the desire to reward this one, the desire to punish that one. Um, I'll say we, it's a little hard to really push the point here, but um, I would like to put on the table as a strong hypothesis that if we can find the right way to scientifically test it, that we are really observing you know, approval and condoning of some types of behavior and definitely shunning possibly condemnation or even moral outrage um, for some other types of, of behavior. And these are clearly valenced judgments, um, as Antonio put so nicely uh, in his talk yesterday, uh, you know, when you've got valence judgments, they're inherently affective responses. Uh, so, so I believe that these responses are really stemming from an emotional response to the actions. All right, so <laughs> here we are so far. I would love to end my talk here, uh, where we could all leave, you know, in enlightened and, and feeling really good and feeling like an ennobled species uh, to be soon surely saved by, by the noble nature of babies. But as you remember, I told you there were two parts, two chapters to my talk. So now comes chapter two, where, for which I will just apologize in advance because it's not quite as positive of a, of a conclusion. Well, we know that humans, as humans, as human adults, we have a lot of social preferences, uh, even for people we don't know individually. Well, one type of preference we have is that we tend to like other individuals from our own social group. What about very young human individuals? Do they also like individuals from their own social group? We know that babies who are raised, being raised in a racially homogeneous environment where they only get exposure to one uh, or vastly predominantly one, um, one racial category of people, will prefer to look at photographs of new individuals of that same familiar race and will prefer that over photographs of someone of a foreign race or an unfamiliar race. We also know that babies prefer individuals who speak the same language they are familiar with um, or who speak that language with a native accent over those who speak that language with a foreign accent. And we also know that human adults prefer others who are similar to them. We like folks who are like us over those who are unlike us. Um, and lovely work 
in social psychology from the 1970s on has shown that this is just an absolutely promiscuous, ubiquitous tendency and that any trivial similarity will do. It doesn't have to be a genuine, anything that we actually care about. We'll care, <laughs> I'm saying we'll care about things that we don't care about. And what I mean is if um, I ask you to flip a coin uh, and it comes up heads or tails, and then I tell you that there's some other individuals you don't know, and some of them flipped a coin and it came up the same as you, heads, let's say, uh, and some other individuals that came up tails. That is sufficient. That's sufficient to cause you in a bunch of subtle ways that you may not be consciously aware of at all uh, to prefer the other individuals who threw a coin and it came up heads. I mean, totally stupid and ridiculous, but there we are. We're stuck with that for adults. Um, my colleagues and I were interested in wondering, oh, in wondering, we were wondering, we were interested in scientifically investigating the question, do babies also, you know, how early do these preferences for similar to self arise? Um, do babies like others who are similar to them? And to ask this question, the similarity we decided to ask about, we had to pick some dimension of similarity, we decided to pick similarity of opinion because we wanted to get away from familiarity. We know babies prefer familiar others, others of a familiar race, others who speak a familiar language. Uh, they prefer a female face if they are raised by predominantly, you know, if a female caregiver is their primary caregiver. They actually prefer a male face if a male caregiver is their primary caregiver and they're exposed a lot more to male caregivers. So we know babies prefer familiarity. So we wanted to just make an equal playing field in terms of what's familiar to baby and ask about similar to you. So how do we ask about, you know, do babies prefer others who have the same take as they do? Very simply, we ask baby's opinion about something. Okay, what's your opinion of these two toys? And then we introduce them to two characters who one of them has the same opinion as the baby and makes the same choice and the other has a different opinion. And then we ask them, who do you like between these two? So here's how it goes. This is a seven-month-old baby. Can you see this one, too? Hi, Sophie. Which one do you want to play with? OK, she has chosen the yellow helicopter right. over the green car. Now she's going to be introduced to two characters who have different color t-shirts. So be paying attention to which character agrees with the baby and which one holds the other opinion. What? that. Ugh. I don't like that. Hi. What's this? Ooh, I like this. Hi. What's that? Ugh. I don't like that. Hi. What's this? Ooh, I like this this. Okay, so now in the third phase, we just present her with the two characters. And who does she okay, pick? Sophie, can you look at me? So, which one do you like? Okay, good job. So that's how the study goes. So we've done this now with many different types of um, stimuli. We've asked babies their opinion about toys. We've asked their opinion about uh, what colors of mittens they would prefer to wear, and we actually put the mittens on the baby's hands. Um, we've asked it about two foods, one of which babies like and the other of which they don't like. We've asked it about two foods where babies love them both, but nonetheless, they're only allowed to pick one, so they have to, you know, pick one at the expense of the other. and. Uh, we've tested it with 11-month-old babies, and we've tested it with 7-month-old babies. And again, what you see, blue bars are the proportion of babies preferring the characters that chose the same as them and expressed the same valuation. Um, red are the bars with babies uh, choosing the character that had the other opinion from them. And the effect is pretty much just as strong at 7 months as it is at 11 months. Um, it's basically, again, we're kind of hitting the ceiling at around 85% which is probably the best you can ever get uh, for a population of very young humans, no matter what you're asking them. Uh, there's one exception, one case where we don't get this effect at all. 
And that is if we don't actually let babies choose which they prefer. We just show them, look, we've got two options here. In this case, yellow mittens and orange mittens. We're going to give you the orange mittens um, or, you know, or the yellow mittens. And, and then we just give the mittens to the two puppets and they don't choose either. Uh, in this case, babies don't care. They actually perform at 50%, you know, choosing either one. It's not about perceptual similarity to the baby. They don't care that someone else has the same color mittens they're wearing. It really is about a difference of opinion. You expressed the same, you're, you and I have a shared stance towards the world. You have expressed a different value from me um, and have a different stance. So just to pause for a minute, um, why might we be built <laughs> as, you know, as a species to prefer others who share our views uh, and tastes? <clears throat> well, one obvious reason is uh, that this could be useful for us and may have been uh, adaptively selected is that others who share our tastes and preferences often share our own desires and goals. They may have knowledge and skills that we need. We may have knowledge and skills. You know, we can cooperate together towards our common goals um, and, and be helpful to each other. Another reason is, even if it's a, an opinion that I don't actually really care about that much, the mere fact that you share my taste for something, in some cases, may be a cue that you belong to the same social group as me, where I don't actually know all of the individuals in a group. So, um, cuisine is a, um, yeah, is a frequent, um, you know, marker of different ethnic groups and different, we know people that have grown up in different areas eating different food really have different tastes. And so if you just meet someone new and find that they like the same type of cuisine you do, that often can be an indicator of a shared group. And there can be advantages um, and have been advantages in the history of the human species to um, being able to identify others who belong to your own social group. And then the third reason is even within our own social group, right? We have a lot of decisions to make together as a society or a sub-society or a subgroup of society. And you know, we're <laughs> how many of you have been like at your own job or, or faculty meeting if you're in academia, right? There's always different little pol mini political factions and everybody's trying to like argue their own way. Getting together with others who share your opinion gives you political clout. It's like we could be looking at the, you know, the earliest formed special interest groups here. It's, it's always been useful. Um, to strategize and to try to push your own agenda and convince the larger world that you guys are right if you can drum up the you guys, you know, into a, a nice sized bunch. Okay, so it's fair enough to like others who are, um, who are similar to ourselves. Uh, we all tend to gravitate naturally. M most of our friends share, you know, we're friends because we share some outlook on the world and have some commonalities uh, and, and there's nothing sinister in finding that this is a deeply uh, held element to human nature so deep that it occurs in, in young babies. Well, let's ask the next question though. How, how strong is this liking for the similar? And is it just a preference or is there also an active disliking for, for the different? How do babies want these individuals to be treated? So, how do we ask that question? We in give baby a choice between two items. Let's say they pick the graham crackers in this case. Then we introduce them to two puppets. One chooses the same as the baby. The other chooses the opposite. And then, for half the babies, it's the one who chose the same as them is now trying to open a box and is treated nicely and helped out by one character. Treated meanly and hindered by another character who slams the box shut. Of course, for the other half of babies, it's the puppet who chose opposite to them and expressed the reverse preference, who is now trying to open the box and is being helped by one character, hindered by another. So our questions are, do babies want the similar-minded other to be treated well? And what about the different-minded other? Do they still want that character be tr to, do, to be treated nicely? It's like, well, I don't like him as much as the first guy, but really, I like characters who treat everybody nicely. Or maybe they just don't care at all about this different guy. Like, you're different from me. Why do I care how someone treats you? When it's the like-minded character that's being helped and hindered, just as before, we find a very robust preference for the helper. 
What about when it's the other minded character? I am sorry to tell you. <laughs> um, this was with nine month olds and 14 month olds. And this is like probably the finding that I got in my lab where the first time where I really felt let down by my, in like, you have failed me, little ones. Um, I was. I was chagrined by this. And we can see, okay, justice for all, especially those who are like me and those who aren't like me, maybe let's apply a different justice to them. And it seems that even if you haven't done anything wrong, anything other than liking the Cheerios more than the graham crackers, uh, it's, a, it's a scary world out there. So what does all this say about babies. Well, all right. I already gave that one away. Just, you know, babies are smarter than you think. Uh, the more interesting question, I think, is what does all this say about us? What does it say about humans and about human nature? Um, well, it says that evaluating others, going out into the social world and making opinions about just about everybody is basic to our psychology. And I I haven't given you evidence that babies do this for everything and every person. Uh, but that's a hypothesis I am very seriously beginning to entertain, that there may just be no such thing, even to an infant, as a neutral human being that one has no opinion about at all. We are getting some findings from not we, as in me, we as in science, in, in the, the world of adult social psychology, that there really may be no such thing as a truly neutral human being, you know, as, as someone that we just have no opinion. And I am beginning to suspect this may be the case as early as we care to go, that in the social world, it is that deeply essential to us in navigating that social world that we m must generate opinions about others and that we do it fast and we do it automatically and we do it ubiquitously. We're assessing others on a whole host of attributes, by their traits, by their similarity to ourselves, by their behavior to others, by who they're affiliated with um, and who they're enemies with. And we can see this uh, very, very early on in human life. And we see this tendency cashing out in ways that form the basis for morality in terms of concern and care for others in terms of recognizing the principle of fairness, in terms of moral approval and moral outrage, or if you want me to be a little less loaded and stick a little closer to the data in terms of uh, inclinations for who's deserving of reward and, and whom to punish. Uh, and we also see it in ways that reflect, um, you know, that underlie some of the deepest reasons for human conflict and even evil. So at last we can satisfy John Barth and give him an answer to his question, um, the answer is not that we're neither. It's not that we're one and it's not that we're the other. Um, the answer is we can see both the seeds of good and the seeds of evil uh, as two sides, both sides of the coin of human nature as early as we care to look. Okay, I'll end there, thank you. And as I understand our program next, there is some time for questions. Just going back to the first study, uh, just with the good and bad guys, I was wondering if you've taken a look at, uh, at the, the babies that uh, said, liked the evil guy better. Was it like consistent? Was it like in all these scenarios that uh, there were the ones that liked the one, uh, the evil guy, or was it just maybe more random? That's a great question. For anyone who didn't hear, the question is, what about that 15% of babies who choose the bad character? Um, we don't know the answer. It's a fascinating question, and we are starting to turn to um, trying to answer that question. It involves needing to test babies, many a single baby many times in different scenarios to see is there actually some individual consistency? Um, is it, as I speculated in my talk, that it's just 85-ish percent is ceiling performance and any individual baby is 
they're not all paying perfect attention or whatever? Or is there something going on that some of that subset of 15% actually like or choose deliberately and are drawn to the negative character? Um, I think that's a fascinating question. I've begun some uh, initial studies into asking whether early experience may play a role. So if you imagine babies aren't all brought up or born into equally wonderfully supportive and friendly environments. Some babies are born into really, um, I mean, there's, there's just impoverished environments is one thing. That's not really what I'm talking about, but into socially chaotic and dangerous environments where there may be a whole lot of conflict, a lot of not enough to go around and might makes right and there's inconsistency and every, every person for themselves. Um, when is it beneficial to start identifying with the bully and how early do we do it? Um, so I don't have an answer for you, but I do think it's a very important and fascinating question. Yeah. Okay, thanks so much. Uh, have you found any difference uh, between uh, genders? We have not found any difference between uh, genders yet, between boys and girl babies. We, it's true that we haven't really been able to because so many babies all choose one. That means in any individual study that might only have 16 babies in it, maybe only one or two or three or sometimes four chose the other. So th those numbers who chose the bad character or the different character are very, very small. Uh, we've never observed any sex difference um, in any of our studies. If I had to say which would have more, <laughs> no, like it's, uh, it, it, it's not enough to, to really tell, but we have had subjects of both sexes, some, you know, sometimes choose the wrong character the wrong character, the bad character, the evil guy. Um, there, there's a... Uh, okay. um, I just wanted to ask about uh, self-judgment, actually, uh, in terms of the, the question of whether, if I'm naughty, whether I would like to be punished or not. And actually, if, the, if you have any evidence that that's not the case, is there any hope that I wouldn't judge others if I do not want to be judged? All right, so you're putting your finger on one, one facet. Uh, you know, th there's another element in which young people are worse than, than older people. Um, and that is, as older people, we eventually start to apply the principles we have for third parties to ourselves as well. That is a very long and slow and protracted developmental achievement fraught with difficulty at every turn, and we find plenty of examples in the adult world where, you know, where individuals are very happy to follow one set of rules for themselves, not the set of rules they're applying to everybody else and trying to get away with all kinds of crazy evil crap. Um, so I don't want to hold human infants and young children to a higher standard than adult. Like, we find in adult, even in adult human nature, um, we kind of know what the moral principles that are. Often we want to kind of find a way around them. Often it's also the case that we, we try to hold ourselves to them, and often successfully. Uh, and sometimes where we fail, we were trying and just fell short of our own ideals. Um, but, you know, what we do see very clearly in toddlers and young children under about the age of at least four or five is they're pretty freewheeling about, um, you know, once they're verbal but still really young, they'll be very open about, yes, I have expectations of everybody fair. I know that's the right thing to do, but I'm not going to do it. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very hard and difficult road. But that process of explicitly articulating an abstract principle is what I think allows us to then at least entertain that how that principle applies to us. Like it's that capability for abstract rational thought that enables us to entertain a counterfactual maybe where we are the, the potential to be injured party rather than the, the perpetrator. Um, 
and, and can, can say, wait a minute, my principle of justice says that that's wrong, uh, but that, that's never easy even for adults. It would, would be easier for me to speak Polish, so... Chciałbym zapytać, czy takie małe dzieci myślą? Mam podejrzenie, że tak, ale nie do końca wiem, jak to robią. Bo nieważne, jak ja analizuję sposób, sposób, w jaki ja myślę, to bardzo potrzebuję wtedy słów, języka, bo wszystkie moje myśli są sformułowane słowami jakimiś, a takie małe dzieci nie potrafią jeszcze mówić. A druga rzecz to wydaje mi się, że jest do tego potrzebny jakiś rodzaj takiej samoświadomości. Nie wiem, czy na ile takie małe dzieci to mają, więc jeśli myślą, to a podejrzewam, że tak, to jak myślą? Thank you very much. Um, the question, there's two questions. First of all, how do babies think without language? When we think um, as, as the... Um, questioner has said, and it's certainly my own experience as well, when I think I'm aware of like thinking in words, uh, and there's actually a lot of scientific evidence too that uh, in many cases we really are thinking, and our thinking is closely tied to the language um, that we have learned. Uh, and if babies do think, um, at least for the studies, I'm not clear if, the, if I think that your question was referring to the types of studies that I was presenting. Uh, in order to have this type of performance that we see, babies need to have some self-awareness or consciousness of self. Um, and uh, the questioner is expressing questions, you know, is it a, it's a question, do babies actually have that level of concept of self? So as for the question of how babies think, um, well, all I can say is you're right, they don't learn language, but the last 30 years of infant cognition have shown that there is a lot of complex mental capacity going on. Um, and there's a lot of unconscious mental thought that we're doing that is taking place independently of language, as well as pretty much all of animal psychology, um, the vast majority, everything except maybe the very relatively s s tiny proportion of studies on other species where you've given them some type of symbol um, there's, there's no, you know, they're not using language in their responses. So I could also point to anecdotal evidence. If you look at that very rare set of human adults that don't have language or human adults who didn't have language until a certain point, Helen Keller, for example, or adults who are born profoundly deaf and don't learn sign language until adulthood, um, and then ask them about events that happened much earlier on in their life prior to their having language. They, they remember them, they can tell you about them, and they can describe what they thought of them. And there's also a lot of evidence in cognitive psychology that when we're not thinking in language, we often are thinking in pictures. So clearly it happens. We are able to think without language, even though our experience introspecting is that we're, we're needing language. In terms of your other question, um, I think you're absolutely right. And the best example I can give is that in order to be able to tell who's similar to me and who's different, who's got the same opinion I do, um, babies have to be making a comparison, a social comparison to self. They have to be representing the I, the me, the self in that comparison. Um, right now, the developmental psychology field has pretty much consensus that we arrive at a concept of self at around two years of age. I do not believe that consensus. I am very suspicious of that consensus. I think most of that consensus rests on the findings of the one type of study we have to ask the question, which involves putting a spot of rouge on a toddler's forehead uh, without them knowing it, presenting them with a mirror and seeing if they rub their own head versus look at like, who's that strange person in the mirror and what have they got on their forehead? Um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, it's never a good idea to rest too much theoretical weight on one single task 
um, that may have a lot of other requirements uh, embedded in it as well in order to succeed at it. And I think um, I'm personally pretty convinced, though I admit the scientific data aren't all there yet, but I would point to our own studies as initial studies that uh, a sense of self and a notion of self as recipient of others' attention, engager with others, and, um, you know, possible, you know, candidate for comparison uh, with others is present from very early in life. So I got uh, two questions. First one is like more technical because I suppose the, mm, when babies are the subjects, it's not so easy as with the adults. So uh, how hard was to mm, gather a um, sufficient number of babies to um, make research, let's say, statically significant? significant? And the second question maybe mm, more controversial, uh, controversial. Uh, did you think, uh, especially when um, uh, you discovered the, the, the second part, the immoral part, uh, that maybe uh, we should change the way um, we perceive right and wrong things about morality? Because, yeah, we uh, tend to think about babies as like more pure creatures, let's say, so maybe uh, this is the way that uh, the, the morality should uh, look alike, as uh, they um, think about it. Thank you. Okay, so I <laughs> I'm sorry. It's at the end of my talk. You're, just give me a cue. Where, what was your first question? Oh, the, how hard it is to get babies. Um, well, I'm fortunate enough to, throughout my career, to have lived in a reasonably large city, first Tucson, Arizona, and... New Haven, Connecticut isn't a huge city by any standards, but um, the hardest part is actually finding parents and their phone numbers to get a hold of, um, and sometimes that's easier or more difficult just depending on a variety of things. Now that everybody has cell phones instead of landlines, it's harder than it used to be. But once we actually get a hold of parents, um, most parents are really happy to bring their babies in um, I think if you're a parent of a young baby, just and, and you're you're not working full time, but you're you know because the parents that are coming with their babies have some you know aren't working full time because if they were, they wouldn't be finding time to come in with their babies. Um, the thought of getting to actually spend some time with another adult who's as interested in your baby as you are, and it's all about you know it's deeply you can learn about babies and contribute to the science of. Uh, science learning more about babies, they're, they're very generous with their time and most parents are willing to bring their babies in, you know, uh, in we, we usually have them come in for, for many different studies um, over the course of their babyhood, like studies that aren't related to each other. Uh, we would never bring the same in baby, you know, for a really super similar study because they might have been tainted by a previous study um, of the same nature. But um, yeah, the, the parents are generous in bringing them in. And in terms of should we, so if I'm understanding your proposal right, you're saying, well, maybe should we take whatever our inherent nature is as the, the, um, the proscriptive model of what we ought to do, and maybe it's right to, you know, maybe we should view it as a moral imperative to care more about those who are close to us and those who are similar to us than those who are different from us. Um, and certainly you can imagine, I mean, not imagine, but you can under, one can, there are cases where that is true, right? If a parent, this is a, I'm giving this example, sh borrowing it shamelessly from my colleague Paul Bloom, who's mentioned it many times in different things, but if a parent really doesn't privilege their own child over a complete strange child in some way, like, at a very abstract level, we might sort of admire that parent's ability to abstractly recognize the equality of all human life, but we'd surely think there was something sort of monstrous about that adult, like, oh no, my child and his friend Timmy that I've met for 10 minutes both fell into the, I only have time to swim to one of them and the other is going to drown. Oh, well, I guess I'll just flip a coin first and then I'll off to go save Timmy. There's something, you know, that would hit us all profoundly uneasy. Um, 
yet our, you know, our intuitions as adults who are trying hard to make the world a more globalized place with more consideration for impoverished individuals and the down and out says, you know, we do recognize an abstract principle that all, any individual life is, every individual has as much right to life as any other and as much call to be treated with, as an object for moral concern and, and to come under our umbrella of moral consideration. And I think um, we could ask the question, but I don't think any of us would actually really, I mean, are any, if any, I don't know anyone that's tempted to ask that very seriously because it just violates with uh, another moral intuition that we hold very dear. Uh, I will speak in Polish. All right, let me get my, my translator. Universal translator on? Okay. Mnie ciekawe, czy było badania przeprowadzone na dzieciach, że jeśli, bo tu było porównanie między osobami, które dokonywały takiego samego wyboru, a że dzieci też lubią tak samo wyglądających albo mówiących jak one, prawda, w tym wychowywanych, prawda, tak czy dobrze to zrozumiałem w wykładzie. I czy były badania, że jeśli na przykład osoba, która wyglądała jak dziecko w podobie, na przykład, że była wychowana przez załóżmy białą kobietę, dokonuje odwrotnego, odwrotnego jego wyboru niż dziecko, czy to później wpływało na wybór dziecka, czy później jeszcze raz wybierało tak samo jak było wcześniej, czy były takie badania, czy po prostu jak dziecko później szło, czy szło właśnie w tym kierunku, że tak się zachowała osoba, którą jest zaznajomiona i zmieniała swoje jakby tory myślenia, czy bardziej broniła swojego wyboru i po prostu później się jakby bardziej chciała integrować z dziećmi, które, albo z osobami, które dokonały takiego samego wyboru jak one. That is a great question. So the question is, um, if the child makes one choice, but an individual they know well makes the other choice, like say they're, the child chooses the toy helicopter, but their mother chooses uh, the toy car, what does the child, you know, which wins out in that type of situation? Um, we actually have just recently completed a study that pits those two things against each other. Um, and in fact, we haven't fully completed all of the conditions yet, but the pattern it looks like we're getting is that younger babies just go with their own choice. I like the car, I like this puppet that likes the car, even though my mother um, uh, chose, you know what, I'm screwing up. We didn't, <laughs> sorry, we didn't test exactly what you did. What we could, hello, brain, wake up. What we pitted against each other was this character chose the way you did, baby. This character chose the other way, but the mother comes along and says, oh, you're good friends, I like you, and expresses all kinds of positivity towards this character, and uh, I don't like you. So, so it's not who's similar to the baby, but it's who, you know, who's getting a positive regard in my social circle, who's affiliated with my mother in a positive way. So that is a different question. Um, what we're finding there is that the young babies are really just caring about their own preference. Uh, the older babies, around 20 months of age, are ignoring their own preference and choosing to uh, prefer the character that has an affiliation with their mother. So the reason I, uh, I suspect that we would get that exact same phenomenon if we ran the study you suggested where the mother chooses the car uh, or chooses the same, chooses the opposite as the baby. Uh, it seems from a lot of different types of research findings from my lab and from other labs that somewhere around a year and a half of age, babies start to be m toddlers, much more attentive to the social cues of the adults around them and what are the affiliations that the adult is cueing to be important and what are the signs that the adult is cueing the baby are important ones and they're willing to kind of overthrow a lot and follow those cues. But um, we haven't actually run the, the exact study that you suggest. It's a good question. Thank you very, very much. Uh, thank you for your wonderful questions. It's been a real pleasure.